Welcome to Skybreak Church. We would love for you to check us out online or on our app to share your story or to support us financially. We know this message is going to bless you and your life. Thanks for joining us. All right, thank you so much. Good morning. You glad to be in church? Say yeah. Awesome, me too. Well, yeah, I'm excited to start this series off with us over the next eight weeks, including this one. Um, I truly believe that God is going to do some great things in this series, and I believe that as we dive into this journey over the next eight weeks, God is going to really reveal some things to us that maybe, um, maybe we've never seen before, maybe we've never really taken the time to understand some things. I first off want to give honor to my pastors, pastors Danny and Janet. I, I love them so much. They, I have the privilege of them not only being my pastors, but being my parents. And um, this man is who he says he is. And who he is on this stage is who he is at home. And I can say that with full confidence. And I'm so thankful that there's been uh, nearly 32 years of investment into this place and into this community by our pastor, my father. Help me honor them, pastors Danny and Janet. We love them. I don't take it lightly to stand on a stage that I didn't build, um, but that was given through this, through blood, sweat, and tears of our pastors, and um, it's an honor to be able to do this today. I'm excited to, to kind of introduce this whole idea of Seven Mile Miracle. Um, the whole idea comes out of the fact of the part where Jesus was leaving Jerusalem after he had rose from the grave and went on a seven mile journey with a couple of people, and so that's why it's titled Seven Mile Miracle, because life is a journey. And it's, it takes some time. It's not easy. And so we're going to dive into the seven statements that Jesus said, um, his last seven statements that he said as he was giving his last breaths on the cross before he died. And I want to talk about how it applies to our lives and taking some things that we may or may not be familiar with at all, but really owning them personally over the next several weeks to incorporate them into our lives of faith on our personal journey with Jesus because I believe if we apply these to our life, it will help us to move forward with what God has for us. I want to start right into it in Luke chapter 24. We're going to kind of start in reverse today. We're going to get to the seven statements of where Jesus said, talking about forgiveness, he said, forgive those who do not know what they do. And he begins to talk through different things. He talks about relationships. He talks about learning how to find help. He talks about the different things, abandonment. And we're going to walk through those over the next seven weeks. But I want to talk specifically on something different today, kind of bring forth a new perspective. Luke chapter 24, we're going to start in verse 13. It says, That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. Basically, they're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. They're talking about all those things that took place. It says, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. I want to stop there, and I want to I want to talk on this first installment of Seven Mile Miracle on the subject of reverse the search. Reverse the search. So if you're taking notes and you want to write a title, write that down. Reverse the search. Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you that your word is, is so powerful. God, as we dive into your word today, help us, Lord, to learn and glean from the seven statements you said and help us to learn on this seven mile journey as we go on this journey together to discover more about who you are. God, open our hearts, open our minds. When we walk through these next eight weeks, as we lead up to Easter, God, I pray that you would begin to burn something in our hearts. Help us to see something that we've maybe never saw before. Reveal to us things in our life, Father, that you want to show us. We press into it today. We thank you. We come with an expectation. Because without an expectation, how can we expect anything to take place? We, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Well, have you ever, uh, got a question for you. Have you ever um, failed? Some of you are like, yes, that's me. I'm not even done with the question yet. Um, have you ever failed to recognize something that you were looking for to only find out that it was right in front of you the whole time? Anybody ever been there? You would like, say, for instance, you were searching for a shirt to wear this morning and you walked through your entire house 
to find that shirt only to find that it was in the very place that you put it. It was in your closet the entire time, but you just somehow seemed to overlook it. I think our life can happen a lot of that, times like that a lot. And I know specifically, my son Chandler has a very difficult time when I say where something is. He cannot find it. It will be right in front of him the entire time, but yet he fails to recognize the very thing that he was looking for. For instance, a week ago, I was telling my son Chandler, he's five years old, okay, so granted he's not 12 or 13. He is five, even though I treat him like he's 12. Um, Parents, help me out with this. You can tell your son or your daughter exactly, hey, go get your shoes on, and you know right where they are, but somehow when they go into their room, they can't find them. Like, They'll look for five minutes, ten minutes, come back. I can't find it. They're right there. They're right outside your door. Go right. They're right. I'm telling you exactly. I literally did this with my son last week. I'm like, your shoes, when you go to your door of your room, turn to the right. Right. Not this way. This way. Turn to the right. They're right there on the floor. Five minutes later, he comes back. I I mean, I'm hearing rustling in his room. I'm hearing things hit the wall. I'm hearing toys fall out of a bin. Like I'm like, what in the world is he doing? Like, is he having a war in there? Like, what is happening? To only find that he comes back and he says, I can't find him. So I physically walk him. If I find these shoes, you know you're going to get a whooping because you know you should have been looking better. Anybody, any parents, any witnesses in the room, you know what I'm... Mm. So I walk over, sure enough, there's your shoes. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm like, I told you where they were. I, I was told one time when I was two or three years old, maybe four years old at the time, uh, my parents couldn't find me for a length of time. It was like two and a half hours, something like that. And uh, the cops were called. We had investigators showing up. I mean, we had people everywhere, the city or the, the, the neighborhood. Um, they were all being, their doors were being knocked on. Like, I'm telling you, my, my mom was in panic. My dad was here at work. He left the church, like left it open, left all the lights on, came home. They were searching for me for for a long time. They looked everywhere. They looked in every closet. They looked in every crevice. They looked in cabinets, under the bed, under the sheets. I mean, they're looking everywhere. Only to find that I was in the very closet that they probably looked through five times, but I was underneath a comforter or some sheets, and they failed to pick those up. What had happened was... We were, we were playing hide and go seek. And needless to say, I am the champion of all hide and seek in our family. I might have gotten a butt whooping that day. I might have blacked that out. I don't quite remember that. But I had crawled underneath these sheets and this comforter. And when my parents had came by, they never took the time to pick it up. Long story short, they picked it up. There I was. And I was found. I was right in front of them and they didn't even notice it. They were looking for me. They had looked there before. And I wonder how many times we go through life searching for something only to find it was right there all along. You see, sometimes on this journey, you can become so familiar with the things in your world and in your life that you, forget, you begin to not notice certain things, even though they're right there in front of you. My point is it can be so close, but yet remain unnoticed. It can be imminent, but also invisible to us. But that doesn't mean it's not there. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. So I want us to go on this road. I want us to go on this seven-mile journey as we go with Jesus and these two people from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And as we look at what happens and what takes place, I want us to go on this journey over the next eight weeks. Are you you ready to go on this journey? You got your shoes laced up? You ready to go on a walk? Because life is a journey. And it's going to take some time to walk through it. So I want to give you some context. So Jesus, he, he, he has days left. He's risen from the dead. He is resurrected just like he said he would. He, he has keys to death, hell, and the grave, the Bible tells us. And he's given the devil a big black eye when he rolled that stone away. And now all of hell is trembling. They're freaking out because the temple that they thought they destroyed has now rebuilt himself because he rose from the grave. And the woman who went to the tomb, they went on a Sunday morning to bring some spices to honor, and they yet they did not find him because the Bible says the angel said to the woman, why do you look for the living among the dead? 
And maybe, I want, I want to point something out. Maybe we are missing the presence of the power of God. Maybe we are missing the resurrection power of God, the redemptive power of God, the rest- restoration and restorative power of God because we're searching in the wrong places. They were looking for the living among the dead. When he already said, I ain't going to be here. He told them. The Bible says he is not here. He has risen. Why are you looking for a living God in a dead place? Why are you looking for a living God in that dead relationship? That dead text thread? That dead Facebook page or Instagram profile? I think it's time for us to reverse the search. You see, the presence of God is not meant to be an add-on or an accessory to your life. It is meant to be an operating system of your life for those who will choose to believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It's not meant to just be something you you tag on like an accessory on your car. It is the motor. It's what runs the entire thing called life. So Jesus has raised from the dead. He's got to go on and get the message out. He's got to get on the road. He's got some things to do. But he only has 40 days to do this, okay? He's only got days. He's got a short amount of time, so he's got to go. So what shall Jesus do on his first reveal as he reveals himself to the world to let him know, let them know that he is the proof of the Son of God, the Messiah, the risen one, that he rose again from the death and death could not feed him, it could not hold him, that the tomb was borrowed. What does he do? Where does he go? He goes on a walk. The very first thing that Jesus does Being raised from the dead is he goes on a walk. And Jesus, on the day of his resurrection, with only days to spare, to tell the world and convince him that convince them that there are these are the signs, these are the proofs. He appears to these two unknown travelers on the road to Emmaus. I mean, at least, come on, Jesus, at least go reveal yourself to someone we know. But he goes to people we've never even heard of. They've never even been spoken before in the Bible. But these two travelers were just like you and I. Walking along a journey called life from Jerusalem to Emmaus on this seven mile road. And Jesus interjects up, interjects with them. Now, how many of you would love to go to Israel one day? And if you could see where Jesus walked, how many would love to go do that? That'd be awesome. How many of you are just fine with watching it on National Geographic that you don't need all that in your life? Anybody? I've been told that if you go to Israel and you go to look with a tour guide to look at the road to Emmaus, if you have a good tour guide, an honest one, they will actually tell you they're not really sure where Emmaus is. That the village that was supposed to be, they, they have... No real legitimate archaeological evidence that that the place they say is they just believe because of context and scriptures and putting pieces together that in this vicinity is Emmaus. And this was about the road that he would have walked on with them. So that makes me wonder, why would Jesus go to a place that wasn't even significant enough in its day to be known even in modernity? even in to be pinpointed on a map. Why would he go to that place? You see, I believe that we look for God in places that everyone recognizes. We think that, that Jesus needs a shout out from Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. We think that he needs to be put on Jimmy Fallon to be debuted of The Resurrected Savior. We think that he needs an Oscar for Best Resurrection because we want to look in places that would be the big wow. But instead... Jesus goes on this dirty road and he meets up with two, two random people. And it's not Kim and it's not Kanye. Nobody knows who these people are. And they're walking toward this road to Emmaus. So Jesus, he, he, just, he died in Jerusalem. Jesus was the, the place where the Holy Spirit was going to fall, where they just celebrated the Passover feast. It, it, Jesus leaves the very place that the Spirit is going to come to go follow two people who we don't even know uh, to a place we have no really idea where it really is. What kind of God would speak to you in a crowd of thousands and would bring you to a place at this moment of time? He just rose from the grave. These people are walking on this road the very same day that Jesus resurrected. 
I want you to picture it now. Picture, there's two things happening here that I want you to realize. One is this, the eternal word of God who was in the beginning, who was God, the fullness of his glory, glory, full of grace and truth, has trampled death, sin, hell, and the grave, made a mockery of Satan, and those who had handed him over, who, had, who were, he was handed over to, were soon going to have every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, who will be exalted to the highest place to sit at the right hand of the Father, who is given the name that is above every name, so that's happening then there's these two unnamed people most scholars believe it's a husband and a wife we, we get the guy's name we never get the woman's name because in bible times many times women were overlooked they were disregarded which goes to show me that jesus that was the exact kind of people he liked to hang around was the people that were overlooked come on somebody he would work a miracle with a little kid's lunch because in their math, kids didn't count. But in Jesus' math, he knew where the multiplication was. It was in the hands of the people that many people overlooked, that they walked past. And I say that because there's probably many of you in this room think that you can only go on this journey if your life is perfect. You think that you can only go on this journey if your life is profound, that God only uses people who are known. Because in our world that we live in today, we worship the idol of fame. That if someone knows you, then you have something to say. When that's not true, because the very famous one, the name above every name, the one, he, he walks up to these two unnamed people. One, we find out his name is Cleopas. So Jesus and Cleopas and this wife, you know, call it Miss Cleo, whatever you want to call her. They're walking on this village called Emmaus, a village, again, that no one knows about to a place that no one really even knows where, where it is. And why would Jesus make one of his most first, most important places of appearance after the resurrection to go to a place away from where the Holy Spirit's going to fall to a place that no one will remember? Why? Why? That, that, that's what got me this whole time I'm studying this whole thing. You see, I think that we tend to look for God in the destination, but he's often found in the detour. We're looking for him in the end, the destination, when I arrive, when I get there. But God is often found in our detours. He is the God of the detour. What I'm trying to tell you is that the perfect, flawless son of God turned his back on Jerusalem, set on a road to go to an unknown place with two unnamed people that seem to really be not really that important because we don't even know who they are, people that we've never met before because he's not the God of arrival. He is the God of the first step. He is the God of the second step. He's the God of every step. He is the God that's with you when you're right and when you're wrong, when you're strong, when you're weak, when you're moving forward or you're moving back. He is right with you. He walks with you. He talks with you because he is the God of the detour, not just the destination. I wonder how many times we've got this wrong. And I believe that there are only certain things that you will ever come to understand about God. And that's when you're at your most lowest, darkest, hurting place in your life. You will only come to find certain things when you reach that point. It's in my experience that it's in the valley that God works his greatest miracle. It's in the detours where we truly learn to hear his voice. I remember when God called me into ministry, when I was trying to do life my own way, I was running from everything, and I, I said, God, I don't want anything to do with ministry because he's got people to deal with it. Because people are people, we're human. We stab each other in the back. We say we love, but then we don't. And I'm like, I don't want to deal with all that because I want to punch somebody. But I remember when he called me into it, I finally said, okay, God, I give up. And it was like I stepped into a fog. I couldn't see anything around me. I stepped into a place where I barely could feel like I barely could see my hand in front of my face. But you want, to, want me to tell you something that I learned in that moment? It forced me to learn his voice. It caused me to lean on his voice rather than my sight because I had to learn to walk by faith, not by sight. The truth is that if I probably saw what was really going on, if I knew where I was walking into, I probably wouldn't have been walking in that fog. I probably would have turned around and said, nah, forget that. But let me tell you something. Some of you right now, maybe your, your, your life feels like you're in a fog right now. 
Maybe your life feels like you've reached the darkest point where you feel like you have no hope. It's completely hopeless. Let me tell you something. Hear me, friend. Hold on to his hand and lean into his voice. Listen to his voice because he will not lead you astray. There's, there's, only, there's something about being desperate for the Father. There's something, there's something so amazing about that. And maybe some of you are in your darkest moment right now. Could it be possible that God has allowed that to happen so that way you could find his voice again? Maybe you're in this dark place because God's trying to tell you, Hello, I need to say something to you. First Peter tells us, after you have suffered a little while. Isn't that just great? It's like, thank you, Lord. After I've been suffering a little while, Lord, I've been suffering for years. But you continue after you've suffered a little while, after you've been in that crazy marriage for a little while, after you've been in a relationship you know you shouldn't have been in, after you've been hurting, after you've been in pain. Here's what it says, that the God of all suffering, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Are you getting what I'm saying? We serve a God who can restore you, who can, who can redeem you, confirm you, strengthen you, establish you. He is the God of the detour and the fog, not the God just of the destination. He's not just the God of the arrival. When you get there, he's on the journey with you. Now notice this. O Cleo and his sugar mama, whoever this may be, are walking the wrong way. Think about this. They're walking away from Jerusalem on this seven-mile journey, walking away from the very place Jesus said he would raise. That makes me believe that if they really believed Jesus was going to raise from the dead, they would have stayed. But they didn't. And yet God started to follow them to a weird place. Because let me tell you, grace, at the end of the day, grace will chase you down. Grace will chase you down. You see, we look for God in the dramatic so many times, but he's often the God of the details. We, want, we look for him in this big bang. We want this big explosion for God to just be like, oh, like he's here. Like that ship's going to come in, baby. I'm going to win the lottery today. Like we, we're looking for the ship to come. We're looking to like Amazon to bring its drone to like drop off the package that has the keys to life and my purpose. We're waiting for this big dramatic expression or a bang. But what God is trying to get us to realize is, is he's in the little details. He's often in the still small voice. And he often reveals himself in the details that many times we overlook or disregard. He's like serving church. The God, you know, um, the way my work schedule is set up, like it's the only day I get. And, you know, I, I just want to go fishing. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, God, it just it doesn't work out that way. Hey, why don't you pay for the meal? God, you see the way my bank account is set up, you know, I got checking and savings. And it takes three days for it to transfer. And I'm just not prepared right now. My cousin's already loaned me some money. Or God's like, hey, why don't you go pray for that person? They really need it. Ah, God, mm, my throat's hurting and uh, my mouth's a little dry. And uh, I, I feel like if I just go over there right now, like I, I'm not really in a place to do that right now. I got my own stuff I'm dealing with. You know, and I'm not, if I start talking, it's just going to probably be like, blah, 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 blah. I don't even know what I'm saying. Are you catching my drift? God's like, start a small group. Yeah, God, I don't really want to get that close to people. You know, they're going to be in my house. I'm not the best clean person, you know. I don't see all them clothes that's on the floor. And uh, I don't think I'm not at the right time, God. It's not the right place. You know, I'm going to wait till I get to my next place, you know, when it's ready. God's like, no, I want you to start a small group. Why don't you go to grow track? Ah, God, you know, I'm ready to get to lunch. Like, you know, they got that, that special at that such and such restaurant. You know, if I get there before 2 o'clock, you know, I'll be good. And God is trying to tell us in the small details. And we're over here waiting for him to speak to us. And we're overlooking it because we're waiting on this big bang. We're waiting on the dramatic. 
We're waiting on this gigantic expression that God's going to reveal himself. And we've totally missed it. Verse 15, let's continue reading. It says, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, have you ever felt like God wouldn't leave you alone even if you wanted him to? Like you tried to disable your conscience, but you still felt bad doing it? Oh, don't be holy rollers in this room. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't come in here with like a polished, a polished halo over your head coming in church. Think about that. Jesus himself, it said, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. How many of us have been kept from recognizing resurrection right in front of us? We're looking for the dramatic, but he's in the details. We're looking for the arrival, but he's the God of the detour. Like, like Jesus, we don't, you don't have time for this. You don't. You got other things to do than just come walk with these two random people. Like, you got people to see. You got to go see Peter. You got to let people know. And Jesus is like, yeah, but I got to go on this road with Cleo. I got to go on this walk with him. And the Bible tells us that they were kept from recognizing him, not that he didn't recognize him. And I want to point that out because I think it's, I think it's important to notice something. So, so Jesus comes up. He enters into this conversation. He just throws up like incognito, like kind of creeper stalkish style. Like he just kind of shows up. And he asks a question. And they begin to spill their guts. They begin to get real with him. They begin to talk about their, 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 their disappointments. They begin to talk about their hurts. And you know what I've, I've found? I've often found that I have better conversations with people that don't know that I'm a pastor than I do with people who do. Because when they know that I am one, they fear that I'll judge them that I'll look down upon them or that, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll start talking all super spiritual when they find out I'm a pastor. Like, I used to drive for Uber. Any other Uber or Lyft drivers in the place? God bless you. I know exactly what you go through. Trust me. Talk to an Uber driver. Just ask him his most craziest story when you get in the car. Boy, they got, we got some stories. I can tell you, when I was driving for, for Uber... I can tell you time after time when people get in the car, like I love driving for Uber because like you never know what you're going to get when you get in that car, especially at the odd ends of the night. You know, it'd be like 1 a.m. You're like, oh, this is going to be good tonight. This is going to be good. You know, it's already surging on the prices and they don't even know what price it is. They just tap in the button and keep going. So people, you know, they get in the car and I'm always trying to like match the energy of the way they get in the car. So they get in all low key. and I'm like, how you doing? Good evening. Welcome. You know, where can I take you? Like I'll be chill. But if they get in the car and they're like, "Woo, yeah, I'm like, what's up, bro? How you doing? Welcome. Get in the ride. We're going to go. Where you want to go tonight? Man, we're going to go to so-and-so. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to get you there. We're going to get there in a flash, baby. They're like, all right, all right. Like, you know, it, we, I match the energy. Like, it's good. I want to have a good time, you know. And as we get along the ride, you know, I just may have picked them up from a place. They may have had a couple hits of something, maybe been drinking a little bit too much, you know, and. I'm not really sure where, you know, what's happening, and so they get in, but it always seems to find this way for them to ask me a specific question. They say, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> Woo, man, <laughs> you really want to ask that question? Because what you just said and what you've been saying and the music that we're playing right now, I'm like, oh, Jesus, purify my ears. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Help me. Mm, nah, 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 that's not happening. You know where I just picked you up from? <laughs> and you want to know where I work, like what I really do. So this at the time, I was specifically leading youth. I was the youth pastor at the time. And I said, oh, uh, I run a youth program. I like to help students, you know, get through life. You know, I'm trying to like candy coat it. I'm trying to beat around the bush. You know, I don't really want to just drop the line on them, you know, because it could get real awkward real fast. And so... I run a youth program. They're like, oh, man, that's great. That's awesome. We need that. We need more of that. I'm like, yeah, man, it's great. Where, where is it at? Mm. Woo! Shouldn't have been asking those questions. You know, can we just deter the conversation? And I'm like, well, you know, it's off on Harvey Road. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's down in College Station. Oh, man, what's it called? Ah! Woo! Boy, I think we need to turn that radio up. Huh? I can't hear you. Huh? And lo and behold, I come to the point where I have to tell them, yeah, 
well, I'm actually, I'm a pastor at Skybright Church. It's like, whew, air leaves the car. Everybody's like, huh? <laughs> you say, what now? And we just, and you just, and we were just at, mm. well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> God bless you, my brother. I'm so thankful for what you're doing for the Lord and the will of God. And they start turning all super spiritual. It's the truth, y'all, I'm telling you. And they fear that I'm going to judge them. I was trying to be in the world but not of it. And if I can get into a place where I'm in an environment where people don't know Jesus, they may be partially high, who knows. But I can begin to speak Jesus to them, even in their most unconscious state, that maybe their spirit man can hear them. But I want you to think about that. Jesus gets more of an authentic version of you when he doesn't have to announce himself. He can get further with you sometimes before fitting himself. He tries to fit himself into your everyday conversations and before he can announce himself. Because when he does, it changes things for us. It changed time and time again. That conversation that I was just having, done. Next thing you know, I was like, well, will you want to come to church tomorrow? And I literally had someone tell me, can you, like, not remember my face, like, when we come in? And I'm like, girl, you're all right. We're all on a journey. It's okay. Like, you're somewhere. I'm somewhere. Jesus is with you. He just wants to be with you. Let me tell you, friend, Jesus can sound like your wife. Wives are hitting. You see your dad? He done said it. I'm trying to tell you. Wife, he can also sound like your husband. He like, uh-huh, you got me. All the men said, y'all weak, y'all weak. Mm-mm. Y'all ain't trying to get slapped. He can also sound like and speak through children, even your children. And what I've come to find in, is most of what you will ever hear from, from Jesus comes through other people. That just because you don't recognize him or he doesn't introduce himself with this big flashy, hello, I'm here, this is God. Like, does it mean that he's not talking to you? So what is keeping me from recognizing the presence of God? Think about these two people. And I know it seems backwards that I'm, we're talking about after the resurrection of Jesus when I just said we're going to walk through the seven statements that Jesus made on the cross. But hear me. Every journey that is successful begins with the end in mind. That when you begin with the end in mind, you will see that no matter what life brings you, the result is that whatever, whatever happens, God will use whatever I go through for his glory. That I am convinced that the sufferings of this present time and age are not able to even be compared to the glory revealed to me if I just stay on the road. I may not understand it all. I may not have all the reasonings, but I got to stay on the road. How many times have we been kept from recognizing what God was trying to do right in front of us? And we missed it. How many times have we been kept from recognizing ordinary joy because we were waiting on things to be perfect? How many times have we missed a miracle because all we could see was the mess. How many times have I missed the opportunity to give something, but because I was so centered on myself? God is saying if you'll change the question and you'll reverse the search, maybe it's not about what's happening to you. Maybe it's about what I want to do through you. Jesus hung high on a cross and he did not come down because he had something he had to do and they didn't recognize it. I didn't recognize that my kids were growing up so fast that I didn't make the time. I didn't recognize the good things in the person that I said I would spend the rest of my life with and so I started focusing on the things that were mildly annoying and eventually I formed an insurmountable resentment towards that person I didn't even recognize. Didn't recognize that the people I was hanging out with were doing some things that would stick with me for the rest of my life and it became an addiction even though it started out as an attraction I didn't recognize. 
and they were kept from recognizing. What kept them from recognizing? I mean, he's right in front of them. You see, you can be kept from the patterns that created your outcomes. You can be kept from recognizing the behaviors that are leading you to the destinations that you hate. You, you hate where you are, but you don't even know how you got there. And it says they were kept from recognizing him even though he was right there with him. So they're walking on this road and Jesus comes up and he asks them a question. Their faces were downcast. I mean, they're, they're, he, he's, he's literally walking up like Jesus was nowhere to be found. All of a sudden, these two people were just, imagine you just randomly walking like in the mall and you got some random person come up and say, hey, what y'all talking about? That's exactly what Jesus just did. Walks up and he's like, hey, what y'all talking about? Like he don't already know. And it says that they stopped and their faces were downcast. But you see, every, everything seems backwards in this situation. He's going towards Emmaus and he's leaving and going away from Jerusalem. That doesn't make sense. He's talking to two random people that don't seem to even be really that important when he's got other things to do. That doesn't make sense. Jesus has just got up from the dead. And if you just got up from the dead, wouldn't you want to hang out with some people that are happy? Like, I would want to find someone who could celebrate with me. Like, come on, turn down for what? We're going to pop something. Like, I just rose from the grave. But Cleopas was sad because it didn't go the way that he thought. It didn't end up the way he thought it would. And so their faces were downcast and they stopped. And apparently Jesus stopped with them and they were sad. And apparently Jesus inserts himself in their sadness. And they begin explaining to the one who created life how life was supposed to turn out. How many times do we give God our blueprint and say, bless this. That's the, reverse it, baby. It doesn't work that way. Verse 18, he goes on to say, then, the, then one of them named Cleopas answered him and said this. Are you the only visitor of Jerusalem that doesn't know what just happened? Cleopas begins explaining to Jesus... What just happened to Jesus? And Jesus was like, mm-hmm. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, the word before God and all the people. Jesus is standing right before him. The great I am is standing right in front of them. And they start with, he was. They're stuck and they were already stuck in what was. Are you missing what is because you're stuck in what was? He goes on to say in our, how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to the condemned to be deaf and cru crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel. Now think about this. You see, hope, hope that is seen is not really hope at all. He said we had hoped. And if you had hoped and you don't really have hope anymore, what you had wasn't real hope. Because real hope can hold on even on Friday when he was crucified. I had hoped, I had hoped it'd be over by now. I had hoped that the medicine would fix it. God, I had hoped that they would have asked me instead of them. God, I hoped they would have said yes. I had hoped it wouldn't be this way. And hope is standing in front of hopelessness. Christ and Cleopas, they're standing right across from each other. The cross had clashed with Cleopas' expectations and how he was left facing down. He was downcast in his disappointment. Let me tell you, friend, we look for God in the dreams, but he's often found in our disappointments. He's found in the dead ends of life. Their faces were downcast and their hope was gone. And from their standpoint, it was over. Can I give you a little travel tip on this seven-mile journey? Don't judge the journey before it's over. Don't judge the seven-mile journey even if you're on, just because you're only on mile two. So Cleopas continues to tell Jesus, yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day and he was supposed to raise again. And some people went and he's like, yes, I know. 
He be, they begin to talk about everything that happened. They came back saying that he's not there. And then they sent Peter and all this thing they said. They, some of them went and they went to the tomb and they couldn't find him. Jesus is like, uh-huh. Because I said on the third day I would raise again. And then I love what Jesus said after this. His response. And Jesus said to them, oh foolish ones and slow of heart. Are you catching this? Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart. Jesus is saying it starts here. You keep trying to make sense of life in your head, and when you can't figure it out, you hop off the road. Stay on the road because you grow as you go on the journey. Just because you reason and cannot figure it out here doesn't mean that it's not right to stay here. Stay on the road. O oh, foolish one, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Jesus begins to quote scripture at them. Was it not necessary that Christ had to endure the cross and should suffer these many things to be entered into his glory? And beginning with Moses, he starts talking about the prophecies of the scriptures, the things that were concerning himself. It says, then they begin to draw near to the village in, in which they were going. And it says that Jesus acted as if he was going to continue on. Like, all right, great talk. And Jesus was continuing on, but Cleopas knew, you can't leave me right now. You, you, uh, you, you, well, hold on, something's happening, and I don't quite get it yet, but, but you can't leave me here. You see, the journey starts where you are, but where it ends depends on you. Cleopas wouldn't let Jesus leave. He said, he continued to say, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us. For it is toward the evening of the day, and the day is far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table, Jesus, he said that he took the bread. And understand in that custom, if you were the host, you were the one who took the bread and broke it. But Jesus, who was the guest, turned into the host. Isn't that crazy? That Jesus walks up, think about it. He walks up and he takes over a conversation. He walks into the house, which he's supposed to be a guest of, and he takes over. And it says that he takes the bread. He lifts it up and he gives things. He says grace. And he breaks the bread and he gives it to them. And the Bible says, in that moment, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. What, what was revealed in the breaking of the bread that wasn't revealed along the way? What, what did they see in that moment? He broke the bread and he gave it to them. What did they see? They saw his scars. He began to be revealed. They didn't know it, but he was right with them all along. They saw what he suffered. You see, sometimes God will, God, sometimes you will see God in the broken places more than you will see him in the high places. Sometimes you have to see it in the scars. I've got scars from things that happened in my life, and I, every time I look at them, I'm remembered of certain things that took place and how Jesus was with me. Even when I didn't realize it, he was with me. Maybe I have emotional scars. Let me tell you, Jesus is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you, the Bible says. And the hands that held them all along were revealed to them when they saw his scars and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Jesus, open our eyes today. Let us recognize your resurrection power, your redemptive power power, your restorative power today. If everyone would stand to their feet for a moment. You know, I'm glad they can't find Emmaus. Because you know what that tells me? That means we get to have our own. We get to be on our own journey, but it's great that we don't have to be alone. I mean, everything seems backward in this whole story. Jesus spent his whole life telling people, other people to follow him. Now he is following them. Are you, are you getting this? His whole life on this earth, he would say, drop everything and follow me. Come, if you want to live a life of, to the full, follow me. But now after resurrecting from the grave, he goes and he finds two unnamed people on an unknown road and he starts to follow them. He's come down out of heaven, and instead of people coming to God, He has come down to us. He has reversed the search. 
You weren't even looking for him, but he was looking for you the whole time. He was showing himself all along. And he is here today and he wants to insert himself on your road to Emmaus and reveal himself to you in a, such a profound way because he is the God of the detours. You may feel like you're in a detour right now. Let me tell you, that's exactly where God wants to find you. He's the God of the details. He's the God of your disappointment. He's also the God of a new beginning. With every eye closed in this room, every head bowed, maybe you're in this place and you found yourself today in a detour or in a disappointment. Maybe you've been waiting for God to show up in this big dramatic expression and yet you're seeing that he's in the small details that he's been trying to speak through other people to you such as today or in the details of the things he's been trying to tell you all along. Let me tell you, friend, that he has come that you may have life and life to the full. And he's come so that way he can give you a new, fresh start today. And if you're in this room and today you've come to the realization that you're in need of Jesus, that you're in need of the Savior of the world, who, who, who God who sent his Son, who was blameless, beyond sin, could not sin whatsoever, but became sin for us. And you come today and you've realized that you, you need Jesus because he's got something to offer that's so much greater than what you could. And you're here today and you want to give your life to him today. You want him to wash you clean of all your sins, to help live a new life that he's created for you, the life that he set out before you were even born. If you're here today, and when I say three and you want to accept Jesus, when I say three, I want you to slip up your hand as high as you can with full confidence. I'm not going to make you come down to the front. I'm not going to make you get in the aisle. I'm not going to make you do anything weird. I just want to know who I'm praying for today. With every eye closed in this room, every head bowed, believers be praying right now for the people on the left and the right. If that is you today, when I say three, slip up your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand today. I see it. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Wow, wow, wow. I see it. I see it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. All the way in the top. I see you. Thank you, Jesus. I see you right here down in the front. I see you. And Jesus sees you. Thank you, Jesus. I see you. Thank you, God. All right, you can put your hand down. I want to pray a prayer. I want everyone in this room to repeat this prayer after me out loud where your ears can hear you in support of everyone. Maybe you've prayed this prayer before. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you raised your hand. Maybe you didn't. But the Bible says just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. So that's what we're going to do right now. So I want, to, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Help me to live a new life in you. God, I accept you as Lord and leader of my life. And God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for me. I accept him today. And I ask that you would forgive me of all my sin. Thank you that you're the God of the detour, that you're the God of the details, and that you're the God of my disappointments. I receive it today by faith in Jesus' name. And everyone said a big amen. Come on, let's celebrate with every person that's accepted. Come on, come on.